Welcome to World Med School. My name is Steve Taylor. I'm an infectious diseases clinician at Duke University Medical Center and the Duke Global Health Institute. And this is a micro lecture on malaria pathophysiology. The learning objectives for this micro lecture are to briefly review the microbiology of plasmodium species parasites, survey the pathology of severe malaria, and, and finally review factors that govern malaria pathogenesis from the perspectives both of the parasite and of us human hosts. Plasmodium species are parasitic protozoa they are complex eukaryotic pathogens, and there are more than 100 species described thus far. They infect humans, non-human primates, birds, reptiles, and rodents. For each of the plasmodium species, the host is one of the above-listed vertebrates, and the vector is one of many genera of mosquitoes, depending upon the plasmodium species and the vertebrate host. There are five human plasmodium species that cause malaria. Principal among these is Plasmodium falciparum, which is the most widespread, distributed throughout the tropics experiences intense transmission, particularly through areas of sub-Saharan Africa, and is very deadly. Plasmodium vivax is limited mostly to South America and to South and Southeast Asia. It can cause debilitating disease that's also recurrent owing to its ability to re remain latent for long periods of time before recurring. Plasmodium nolzi is the m most recent human malaria, confirmed in, to cause human infections uh, in an endemic fashion just 10 years ago in Southeast Asia, principally in Malaysia. And finally, Plasmodium malariae and Plasmodium ovale have uh, limited trans ranges of transmission and intensity of transmission. Plasmodium species all share a similar life cycle in both a vertebrate host and in a mosquito. In the diagram depicted here, a human host is located in the middle. To the left is the cycle in the mosquito, which is critically important to transmission, but which is not going to be the focus of the rest of this micro lecture. On the right are the two parasite stages that are present in humans. At the top right is the exoerythrocytic cycle, which takes place in hepatocytes. After inoculation into the skin of sporozoites by the mosquito vector, the parasite rapidly infects hepatocytes, during which a clinically silent phase is initiated of about 7 to 10 days. After that period of time, hepatocyte, the hepatocyte ruptures, parasites enter the blood bloodstream, and initiate the erythrocytic cycle. As you can imagine, during the erythrocytic cycle, the parasites sequentially invade, mature within, and rupture red blood cells for an asexual blood stage. And it's the blood stage of plasmodium infection that causes what we call malaria. Parasite infection of red blood cells during the blood stage is so heavy that the parasites can be fairly easily visualized on standard light microscopy. Here you can see several forms of the developing plasmodium falciparum parasite within red blood cells starting on the left with immature trophozoites, or, or as they're more commonly called rings, through mature trophozoites to the stippled schizonts, which take up most of the cytosol of the red blood cell, and which eventually rupture to liberate mirozoites, which are pictured here only as a cartoon because mirozoites do not exist very long outside of a red cell before finding a new red cell to invade and returning to immature trophozoites. This is a highly programmed cell cycle depending upon the plasmodium species, that takes between 24 and 72 hours as the parasite sequentially invades and develops during the blood stage. At the bottom you can also see a picture of the parasite life form known as gametocytes. These are the sexual forms of the parasites which are eventually ingested by mosquitoes during a blood meal and then taken on to infect another unsuspecting host. But they don't directly cause disease within the host so I won't focus on them for the rest of this micro lecture. As you've learned from probably other micro lectures in this series, the common signs and symptoms of malaria are fairly nonspecific, usually marked by fever, accompanied by chills and rigors, and other nonspecific symptoms like headache, arthralgias, and back pain. Red blood cell destruction is fairly prominent, as you can imagine, for a, a parasite that infects and ruptures red blood cells. This manifests as anemia or pallor on exam, and vascular congestion results in hepatosplenomegaly. The most baleful complication of, uh, of malaria, specifically plasmodium falciparum infection, is severe malaria. One of the distinct forms of this is cerebral malaria, which is marked by some degree of neurologic dysfunction, sometimes coma, often accompanied by seizures, and carries a very poor prognosis. Severe malaria anemia can also result either to, owing to chronic or acute infections. And there's a more nonspecific syndrome of multi-organ dysfunction, which is fairly characteristic of other serious bacterial and viral infections, including circulatory collapse and shock, respiratory distress, renal failure, lactic acidosis, and coagulopathy. Although the clinical features of malaria are fairly nonspecific, Plasmodium falciparum infection has several characteristic pathological changes, several of which can be seen here on these, in these pictures. Uh, this is a, from an autopsy series from a patient who died of cerebral malaria owing to Plasmodium falciparum, 
In the top left, you can see a section of the brain with both gray matter changes and microhemorrhages within the white matter. This is reflected in the bottom left when the capillary bed here is clogged with fibrin and infected red blood cells, leading to a local infarction and a microhemorrhage. In the two slides on the right, from a smear and from a pathological section, you can see blood vessels which are clogged and backed up with infected and uninfected red blood cells, which are adhered to the walls of the endothelium, causing local tissue ischemia. This ability of plasmodium falciparum infected red blood cells to clog vascular endothelium is known as sequestration and happens throughout deep vascular beds. Indeed, this sequestration of infected red blood cells can seen in, be seen in a variety of tissues, including the ones pictured here, such as myocardium, colonic mucosa, pulmonary vasculature, and adipose tissue. This, this phenomenon can also be visualized in the placenta. In areas highly endemic for plasmodium falciparum, pregnant women can experience the distinct syndrome known as placental malaria, in which infected red blood cells adhere to extracellular ligands pr pl present in the placenta. This causes local inflammation and has adverse effects on the placenta, leading to intrauterine growth retardation and low birth weight. Now we'll review some of the specific mechanisms that, from both the parasite and the host that result in the pathogen correction. It may seem obvious that a parasitic infection of the blood leads to malaria, but the truth is that the clinical manifestations and the severity of those manifestations is very broad with plasmodium infections. And therefore, the pathophysiology and the pathogenesis of malaria results from a complex dialogue between both parasite and host. Here we'll start to review some of the parasite factors that contribute to the pathogenesis. Anemia, as you can imagine, results both from red blood cell destruction owing to the parasite's blood stage, along with dys dyserythropoiesis results from a general bone marrow dysfunction. This itself is due in part to a generalized cytokine activation, which is potently initiated by hemozoin released by ruptured red blood cells, as well as uh, expressed in soluble parasite antigens. Parasite density, or simply the biomass of infecting parasites, can also contribute to severity and is associated with severity. It's known that plasmodium falciparum infects all types of red blood cells and therefore can obtain fairly high densities in the blood. In contrast, plasmodium vivax only infects reticulocytes and therefore its ability to achieve high densities is very limited. Finally, there are two specific pathogenic phenotypes which have been well described for, for plasmodium falciparum known as sequestration and rosetting. We saw these in the earlier pathologic slides in which blood vessels were filled with infected and uninfected red cells. Sequestration is defined as the adherence of infected red blood cells to microvascular endothelium, and rosetting is defined as the adherence of these infected red cells to uninfected erythrocytes, and both of these are fairly common features of falciparum malaria, specifically severe falciparum malaria. Sequestration and rosetting deserve some further mention because they're one of the more fascinating features of parasite biology. Both phenomena are thought to be mediated primarily by plasmodium falciparum erythrocyte membrane protein 1, or PFEMP1, a parasite-derived protein that is exported across several cell membranes to be inserted on the surface of the infected red blood cell as quote-unquote sticky knobs. You can see these in the top two pictures. On the left you have a healthy looking red blood cell and on the right you have a plasmodium falciparum infected red blood cell which is not only misshapen but is also studded with knobs full of PFEMP1. And it's thought that these knobs mediate the binding of these infected red blood cells to a variety of ligands in the endothelium and other end organs. These ligands include ICAM1, CD36, chondroitin sulfate A, and complement receptor 1. In the bottom left picture, you can see the apposition of an infected red blood cell on the top and an endothelial cell on the bottom, and how this interaction between the two cells appears to be dependent upon those sticky knobs. And on the bottom right, you can see a rosette, an infected red blood cell in the middle, and then attached to two uninfected red blood cells. PFEMP1 is not only thought to be a major mediator of pathogenesis, but also a mediator of immunogenicity, and it's thought that the adaptive immune response that develops in highly endemic areas for plasmodium falciparum is owing to the recognition of a repertoire of PFEMP1 domains. Pathogenesis results not only from parasite factors, but also from host factors. These include, or are, but are not limited to, innate immune responses, which are potently activated by hemozoan, PFEMP1, and endothelial activation, and these comprise tumor necrosis factor, interferon gamma, nitric oxide, heme oxygenase 1, and a variety of other host-derived factors. Acquired immune responses are also a, a, a characteristic feature of highly malaria endemic areas. And like I mentioned, it's thought that in plasmodium falciparum, 
The acquired immune responses are, consist largely of IgG recognition of PFV and P1 domain, and the additional recognition of more domains is thought to limit the severity of infection. And there are also emerging data suggesting that plasmodium falciparum specifically can mediate the acquisition of immunologic memory to tune immune responses to either attenuate or increase the severity of infection. And finally, there are a variety of human genetic variants which confer some degree of innate resistance. These variants are known to confer resistance to plasmodium falciparum. The most famous of these is sickle cell trait because hemoglobin S in its heterozygous state can protect African children from over 90% from severe malaria. Other known red cell variants that confer resistance to plasmodium falciparum include hemoglobin C, G6PD deficiency, type O blood, and ovalocytosis. In recent years, there's been emerging evidence that some of these red cell variants also confer protection from plasmodium vivax. Uh, these variants include two variants of G6PD as well as Southeast Asian ovalocytosis. These data collectively highlight the fact that pathogenesis arises from a complex dialogue between the host and the parasite. These are some summary points from this micro lecture on malaria pathophysiology. Malaria parasites are parasitic protozoa that have both human and mosquito stages, and there are five species of them that cause malaria in humans. It's the blood stages of plasmodium infection that result in the syndrome that we call malaria, and that the pathogenesis of malaria results from a dialogue between the host and the parasite. On the parasite side, contributors to pathogenesis include red cell destruction, the activation of innate immune responses, and for plasmodium falciparum, sequestration of infected red blood cells in the deep vascular beds. And on the host side, mediators of the pathogenesis of malaria include the innate and adaptive responses, as well as the acquisition or the presence of innate resistance to malaria. Thank you for visiting World Med School.